Oh, also welcome from my side. Uh, as he already introduced me, uh, my name is Dustin Temann. I work for GData, uh, which is an antivirus company located here in Bochum. And we are supporting this course since a few years now. And um, by support, I basically mean we offer an additional evening event. Um, like Marcus described it, uh, my part here is a commercial for it now. Um, the basic idea is we meet uh, together with speaker and all interested students afterwards uh, in the rooms of my company and uh, we will, are going to have a really nice um, dinner um, with drinks and everything and we have a quite cozy atmosphere. So the basic idea behind it is that if you are interested in talking uh, to our speakers like Christian today or uh, if you want to get in touch with people working in the antivirus industry, especially if you want to talk to the more technical people and not the sales guys, um, there's a really good place for it, and um, we often have really nice technical discussions over there. So all of you are invited to join us. Um, the basic details you can see on the slide here, but of course you can come to me after the talk uh, if you like to know any, anything else about it. Um, basically we offer it every time we have an invited speaker here. So if you miss it today because there is some other event, uh, of course we are going to have uh, the opportunity again when the next two speakers are here. So um, I think I talked uh, already enough. Let's uh, give Christian a warm welcome, please. Thank you very much and also welcome from my side. I feel very honored to see this room that full. Um, it's my pleasure to talk today about the Zeus P2P botnet and how we owned it and how in general P2P networks work. And to just give this story a nice start, this is how the press puts it, right? So a German has discovered a hacker legend from Russia. Now this is very exciting. All the techniques behind are also very exciting, but what the press did not know, in fact, is that this is a very old story. So what I tell you today is something that happened from 2012 to 2014. So it's like two years old, this story, but it's still very exciting, you're gonna notice. So one slide, only one slide about me. My name is Christian uh, Russo. I'm currently the research group leader at Saarland University for the group of system security. This is my very shiny, small research group. Uh, currently I supervise three PhD students and one postdoc. And we do everything which is really practical security in network security, for example, in denial of service attacks, but also in system security and very much also in malicious software. So this talk, we're going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer botnets. How do they work? What kind of peer-to-peer -peer botnets do we have out there? Uh, and we're going to look at more interesting at the countermeasures. What can we as researchers do against the P2P networks? And there's two types of things we're going to look at. Namely, one is how can we spy on the networks? For example, how can we see who is part of the network? And the other question is, okay, once we see that these networks are indeed a million infections large, what can we do against them? How can we disrupt these networks? This is all theory. Then we're going to switch to a very nice, exciting part that not many people on the world know, namely how technically we have managed to bring down one of these peer-to-peer -peer botnets, namely the Zeus peer-to-peer -peer botnet back then. And at the end, I'm going to give you some outlook of if I can um, imagine that we can actually own even more botnets in the future. OK, so let's start with peer-to-peer -peer botnets. Why do we have peer-to-peer -peer botnets, and what is a general, what is a botnet? A botnet is very simple. You have a central server in the botnet and you have many infected clients around it that connect to the central server. Which means the server can act actually instruct all the infected clients, for example, to do um, a spam campaign and send the same spam all the same time. At the same time, the bots can also send back information to the CNC server, to the central server, for example, stolen information. And this has very nice opportunities for the bot master, which is the guy controlling all the bots, in order to steal information from the PCs, in order to control the PCs. But this design of a centralized botnet has one very much big drawback. Namely, as soon as you have law enforcement agencies that disrupt this single point of failure in the middle, the network is gone. And this is a severe drawback, right? This has happened quite a lot in the past. The police, the FBI, Europol, whoever has discovered these central servers and took them down and the whole botnet stopped working because the attacker completely lost uh, control of the network. So what did the attackers do? They were smart and they invented something which is a fully decentralized botnet. Which means that, that you have a network where every bot connects to a subset of the other bots in the network. So essentially there is no single point of failure in the network any longer. It's a very interesting design. It follows a graph. 
Essentially, you as a bot connect to a couple of other bots in the network. This is all that you need to do. And then you keep uh, connection to the network. Which means also that, for example, if you receive a command from any other bot, you would just forward this command to all the other bots in the network. And this is how the P2P botnets work in a nutshell. This is a very nice design. Unfortunately, it does not allow us to attack the networks anymore with the techniques that we have known. Right? So there is no single point that they can take offline to disrupt the network. If you take down one node, you have removed this single infection, but all the rest of the network essentially is still working as it was before. So that's an inherent problem that we faced before we did our research, namely that you have P2P botnets and there's really nothing you can do against them. And this is where we kicked in. We first had a look at the P2P botnets out there, which kind of P2P botnets exist, and we looked back until 2006. Um, so the first botnet actually that was P2P arose in 2006, uh, it was called Nugash. After more years and more years, more botnets entered this decentralized scheme because they saw the advantage of P2P botnets. So more and more designs actually adapted to P2P networks. And at some point, you had that many botnets that actually continue to run using P2P systems. So a couple of highlights here, a couple of uh, botnets. For example, the Celity botnet is completely operating on a P2P basis right now. Um, Zerax is another botnet which um, existed in these two variants and a new third variant that is also P2P based came up recently. There is Kelios, a spam botnet, uh, which is also totally um, focused on P2P networks. And finally, this talk is going to be about the Zeus botnet, which is a banking trojan, a banking trojan that tries to manipulate your online banking session. All of these networks have in common that they operate on a peer to peer uh, technology. And as you can see, many of them actually operate over long term. So if you, for example, look at Celity, Celity started operating in 2009 and continues to operate until today because there's simply no efficient technique to take down this botnet. There's nothing we can really do against Celity. So once you have a good P2P design, I'm kind of making advertisements now for this P2P scheme, you actually survive for many years. So what can we actually do um, to understand these botnets? So formally, you know, this is the only formal slide I have today for you. Formally, you can say that you have a graph, and every bot in the graph has a peer list. And this peer list, this concept of a peer list is quite simple. You know a couple of neighbors, peers in the network. And knowing means that you keep a connection to them, or you trigger, like you send them a packet each hour, say, to check if they're still online. So this is the connection that you can actually have to these botnets. And that's the only thing you need. You don't need to keep up the entire like, connection to each and every bot. It really is enough if you take a subset of the bots and connect to the subset of the bots. And this subset is called the peer list. And the peer list typically is like 50 entries, could be 100 entries, but it's really limited in size. You don't want to maintain all the information of the entire botnet in your bot binary. That's not going to fly. This peer list actually allows you to do a couple of things on the graph technology. For example, imagine you have contacts to these three peers, and at some point you lose contact to this peer, and at some point you also lose contact to this peer, and then there's only one peer remaining, right? Then it slowly you, you are slowly disconnected from the network. This is fairly bad. And to survive that, there is typically a mechanism called peerless request, which is you ask your neighbors for their neighbors, right? If you see that your peerless becomes too small, you just ask your neighbors to share their neighbors, and you expand your current knowledge on the graph. This is very powerful, right? You just check, OK, my current peer list is too small, whatever too small means, below a threshold. Then you start asking your neighbors to get more information to expand your view. This is how it works. Eventually, you know, we can actually use that scheme to actually also enumerate the whole botnet. But that's something that we can discuss later. So to illustrate this a bit more from the bot perspective, how does it look like? So usually you have the peer list, which is just a list of really IP addresses and port information, maybe identifiers for the bot that every bot in the network maintains. So for example, bot A may have connections to uh, bot 1, 2, 3, 4, and bot B, which essentially means that bot A has a connection to bot B. And bot B, in turn, has a couple of other neighbors in the list, 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there is a couple of things that are important now. First. The peer lists are not equal, right? Every bot may have a completely different peer list in the network. And second, the connections are not symmetric, right? So it doesn't mean that if bot A knows bot B, that bot B necessarily also not knows bot A, right? So it can be completely decoupled. With the peer list um, exchange, what you actually do now is you send bot B a message. You know bot B, right? You send him a message and ask him, hey, can you please share me a couple of your neighbors? 
Bot B will then take a couple of the, its neighbors, and now it depends really on the implementation, how he does it. He chooses a subset of the data and returns it back to bot A. And bot A now includes all this information in his peer list. And this way, you can actually increase your knowledge on the peer-to-peer -peer graph. Right? <coughs> so the very simple mechanism of peer-to-peer -peer list. Then think of this situation. You spawn a bot on your PC. You want to become part of the network. And you also want that others in the network actually know you, right? because you're your new peer in the network. What you can do then is actually send an announcement message, which means that you just send to any bot that you know, hey, look, I'm a new peer in the network. Please include me in your list. And that's what's going to happen. You just tell B, OK, I'm, I'm new. And B says, cool, I have some slot free in my peer list, and I'm going to include you in the peer list. And this is how the peer-to-peer -peer announcements work. If you start looking at the peer-to-peer -peer network, it's actually not as simple as we had the graph before, right, with a couple of peers, but it's actually very super complex. And if you start crawling the network, and that's actually something we discuss later, you start seeing such a peer-to-peer -peer graph. So don't think that we actually talk about toy examples. It's really about hundreds of thousands of nodes in the network, right? OK, good. So after discussing how the P2P wetness work, let's now look at a couple of countermeasures which, which we can do. And the first thing you might wonder now, how large are these networks? So if we talk about size, right? Um, normally, if you have a centralized botnet, the only thing you need to do is watch at the central point, monitor who is connecting, and count. Right? This is fairly simple. But how does that work in a fully distributed setting? How does that really fly? The second thing you might be interested in is disruption. How can we, once we found out how big the networks are, how can we defend them? How can we bring them down? Let's start with the easy part. So to find out the botnet population, what you can do is a graph search. All you need to know is a single entry point, point to the network. So for example, you can do this by reverse engineering the binary, and there's likely some bootstrap list of IP addresses which belong to the botnet. Then you connect to one of these bots and ask this bot for the peer list. And then you do this iteratively. You ask all the known neighbors that you have for peer list, and you learn new nodes. And you do this again for all the learned, uh, nodes you learned, and you ask again and again and again. And at some point, you will learn the complete graph, right? So this is really a graph search algorithm. It's super simple. It's very efficient. Um, and this way, you can map totally the entire infrastructure. That's what we thought uh, would be the de facto standard. And actually, if you look at a couple of antivirus reports um, out there that claim this botnet is of size X, it has 200,000 um, 200, bots in it, typically, this is based on the crawling mechanism. right? So it's a graph search. However, what we have discovered is that you, using crawling, only can discover routable peers. And with routable, we mean that um, these peers are not hidden behind a firewall. So if you now think about your setup at home, I bet that 90% of you actually have a router between your PC and the internet, right? Which means that there is a firewall between your infected PC and the out an outside world, right? Which also means that our crawler can never reach out to your system, can never actually identify you as being affected. Which also means that the crawling technique heavily underestimates the population size of P2P botnets. As an alternative, what we actually did um, is to also find a technique which discovers all the bots up there which are behind a firewall, which are behind a router, behind a gateway. To do so, we injected sensors to the network. And this is a very exciting part, because now we needed to understand how the peer-to-peer -peer protocols actually worked. So we, again, spent a lot of time to reverse engineer the bot binaries and try to understand how the P2P protocol really works. So what is the message format, say? What is the encryption scheme of the botnets? And once you know all that, you can actually implement a fake bot. And that's what we did here. So we added a fake bot to the network and made this fake bot as prominent as possible. So essentially, we injected a sensor up there in the network. And this sensor has aggressively sent these so-called announce messages to all the other peers in the network. And at some point, all the other peers in the network will know our one bot. Now, the cool thing is, since we have actually many bots behind the network the gateway or behind the router that we still cannot reach, these bots at some point will have a peer list which is too empty, right? And I told you, if it's too small, the peer list, they would ask their neighbors for new neighbors which means it actually takes some time until our sensor is known by all the bots. Because actually, you have to just have to wait until these net appears have an empty peer list, and then we start querying their neighbors and eventually learn about our sensor. 
So we found after a couple of weeks, say two weeks, our sensor is known by all the bots in the network. And what does it buy us? It buys us that every bot in the network essentially is connected to our sensor, and which also means that we have full, the full view on the network. We can actually measure how large these, these networks are, much more complete than crawling. To give you a couple of numbers, there is these, at the point of study, we did this in 2013, there were um, four different zero access botnets, the Zeus botnets, and two Sanity botnets. And this slide shows you the crawling results in terms of numbers of bots we found for the networks. And as you can see, the networks using crawling were found to be like 300 to 400 uh, bots uh, large, uh, the largest ones. Um, we distinguish here between a verified crawling, which is the yellow part, and just crawling. Verified means that we actually found a peer entry in the peer list, plus we could also reach out of the peer and verify that it's alive. Crawling means we just have found the peer list entry. It could be outdated, it could be a completely bogus entry, it's definitely not verified. Now if we add the sensor data to it, you immediately see that we actually crawling would underestimate um, botnet sizes by a couple of order of magnitude really. So for example for Celity, Celity has a very strict uh, scheme when a peer is included in the peer list and if you start actually to um, run sensors, you will find that the botnet is much larger than you originally figured out with the crawling. So for example, by crawling a set is only like 10,000 bots large, with the sensor you would find is 1 million bots large. Which shows you that there's actually two different techniques that you can use and sensors are very powerful to enumerate the bots. This is what you can actually monitor over time. So once you run a sensor, you can monitor the botnet population size over time. And this is what we did for uh, six weeks here. So let's first look at the sinus shape line here. It actually shows the population count that we measured per hour. So every hour we measured how many bots contacted our sensors. And what you can see is that there is clearly there patterns, right? So there's patterns where there's more bots online than times where there's less bots online. And that's simply because there is times where most people have actually switched off their PC and the bots are just offline at that moment. When they switch on the PC, the bots are coming back. What you can also see is there's a typical week pattern of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then two peaks which are actually a bit smaller, which is Saturday and Sunday. And you will see that repeating, right? Weeks, weekend, week, uh, weekend. So really, this is what you can measure with the peer-to-peer -peer sensors. The other thing that we ask ourselves is, okay, the population sizes are, let's say, roughly stable. You know, they don't really double every week. They're more or less stable. So we ask ourselves, how stable is the population? Not in terms of numbers, but in terms of actual bots. So which bots actually stay there forever and how many bots leave the network, how many bots join the network every day? And this is what we measured here in this uh, graph in the, in the bar chart here. Um, essentially, we found that up to 10,000 bots out of the 200,000 bots for uh, the total botnet size, we actually are leaving every day and joining every day. So there was a fluctuation of say 5% of the bots actually left the day and joined the, day, uh, joined the network every day. Which means all of the population is more or less stable, there's a lot of fluctuation. Possibly because people have uh, installed an antivirus uh, software which uninstalled the bot. Possibly because people have bought new installations. Uh, whatever the reason is, actually many people leave and join the networks. This is again a graph, I'm gonna skip over that, it's not really, not really interesting. So let's talk about disruption now. I mean, we figured out um, how we can actually measure the botnet population sizes, and you've seen that botnets actually are fairly large, right? They actually span a million of infections. So what can we do against them? And we came up with a couple of techniques, um, and the easy one is, obviously, you had that in mind probably already, why not become part of the botnet and just inject a command? Right? So our goal as a defender is to bring down these networks. So why not we just connect to the botnet and say, look, uninstall. And uninstall your bot software and clean up yourself. Right? This is a very simple solution. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the attackers have thought of this. Um, so if you look at the schemes, how the attackers actually protect their botnets, is that you will find that all of them use strong crypto schemes to sign their commands. So cryptograph cryptographically sign their commands which means that only the bot masters can actually inject commands. You cannot, because you don't have the private key, you cannot sign the command, which means the bots would actually verify if the signature is strong. We could now argue if RSA 1024 bits is strong enough, sure, you can probably crack that, um, but for schemes like, I don't know, 2048, it's already getting kind of iffy. 
However, what is very interesting is that these guys are on the one hand using crypto, on the other hand though, they're not doing it very smart. So although they use RSA, for example, they do not prevent replay attacks in many instances. So what we could do essentially is record a command, store it somewhere, and then say, okay, at some point later, we're gonna replay that command to all the other bots in the network. This was one option, how we could actually disrupt networks. The other two options are on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So if you imagine that you have typically a very nicely connected P2P graph, there might be ways how to cripple this network, how to cripple the complete P2P design here. And we found there is actually two attacks you can run. One is called partitioning, in which you split the one large network into multiple smaller chunks, which means that there is suddenly 20 botnets instead of one botnet which means the attacker cannot really control the botnet uh, anymore unless he has a connection to each and every peer, which is not the case. The second attack, which is even more powerful, is sinkholing. With sinkholing, you own a central bot, uh, you own a central sensor in the network, a so-called sinkhole, and you instantiate all the bots that they only connect to your local system and all the other connections in the botnet are magically disappear. Right? So you magically bring the botnet into a state that all the other links to all the other bots between each other disappear. How that's going to work, we're going to talk about later. So let's imagine sync calling. There's essentially a couple of steps we can do. So the first very important step is we have to become part of the network. Right? So we want to have, we want to now have that one node. We want to be the very one central point in the network. So the first step we do essentially is announcing a new peer. So that means that essentially we announce a sensor and the sensor then becomes connected to all the other bots network and all the other bots network know our sensor. This is already cool because all the bots know our sensor but it's certainly not enough to actually disrupt uh, the network. And now comes the magic. The magical part now is we actually need to isolate all the peers which means that we somehow need to bring the peers into a state that they lose all the connections to all the other peers in the network and that they only talk to our central peer. And then you have the network in a situation where the botnet and the botmaster cannot really control the network any longer. Which means that at that point you have actually owned the botnet. There's no way the attacker can do anything useful with the botnet at that state. So let, let's look at the peer list again. How does that work? So let's assume we have a botnet with that peer list. And let's assume the peer list had three entries. Very simple. But actually it is normally that simple. We have an identifier. In this case, I think a four byte random identifier. We have an IP address and we have somehow, let's say, an age mechanism. The age might be the number of seconds that I learned this peer ago, right? Um, so the question is now, how can we actually disrupt the, uh, how can we cripple the peer list? And one idea would be, for example, to inject our own IP addresses, which have a very fresh age. So let's say this peer list would be sorted by age and this bot would prefer all the new entries and the old entries are replaced at some point. What you could do is inject peers which have a very fresh age. You keep injecting, keep injecting, and at some point you fill up, you replace the existing peer list with your own peers that you are controlling. Right? This is one way how you can disrupt a network, but only if the network would, for example, favor young and fresh peers. There are botnets out there that do that, but in principle what you need to do is you need to reverse engineer the P2P protocols and understand what you can do in order to manipulate the peer list. So this is just one example, injecting fresh peers, but it only works for one specific botnet. So in principle you need to look at the very same botnet and actually understand how that works. Obviously the situation that you want to have at, at, at the end that you control the entire peer list, right? So what you want to do is you want to replace all the entries with entries that point to hosts that you are controlling. Very good. Concepts clear until here. Because now we're going to apply them to one of the botnets. Very good. OK. So from this point on, I really ask you not to record um, anything in longer of this presentation, because what we show here is now really something that not many people know and we also especially don't want the attacker to know what we did to the bonnet. So please really do not share what is coming next. <laughs>